it's good to be with you tonight and to share in this video time together and to see your faces, at least some of you, and you can see mine. And I hope you can see a smile on my face right now, not a frown. Faces, face-to-face uh, -face contact is so important to us, isn't it? Uh, we, we just take it for granted, and yet it's an essential part of our communication. I remember I have three daughters, and one of them had a pretty obstinate streak when she was younger. And if ever, ever she did anything wrong, you you know, call her out and you tell her to come and sit down a moment and she'd put a stony face on and and then you'd start telling her what she'd done wrong hadn't she and she'd finally admit it and you'd say well are you sorry and she'd say I'm sorry and you knew from the look on her face that that wasn't sincere so then you had to spend more time trying to get her to appreciate the difficulty that you saw in her action until finally she'd agree with you and Instead of the, uh, the insincere sorry, you'd get the real thing, an apology, and then you'd be, everything would be put right and the day would go on. So you could tell from her face whether it was a straight up real true answer or not. And you can look in my face and I can look in yours. And we rely on it, don't we, that experience. It's so very important to us. You know, sometimes they say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. If, if I were to uh, want to, to go out one evening and uh, my wife actually wanted me to stay in, uh, I could say to her, uh, I'm just going to go out with my friends for a bit. Is that okay? And she'd say, it's okay. Now, any guy around here who's married would know that it's okay in that circumstance doesn't mean it's okay at all. And you have to look into her face and see that your proposed action is not okay at all. It's all revealed in the facial expression. I want you to think with me about the Christmas story for a moment that we've just uh, shared together and, and, and think about the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God the Son, come to earth, a little baby. And Mary then looks into this, the face of this little child. And does she see a smile or does she see a frown? We're not told, are we? I can tell you one thing that she didn't, never had to do. She never had to correct him for misbehavior. She may have mistakenly corrected him for what she thought was misbehavior, but we're told that he always did that, what was good and what was right. He never did anything wrong. So unlike my experience as a parent, and perhaps yours too, or perhaps your experience as a child, if you're a, a younger person joining in this call right now, um, very different in the Mary Jesus setting, isn't it? When she looks into his face, she on, sees only sincerity and only love and only truth. That's the kind of person Jesus was when he came to this earth. Came from heaven's throne, uh, poetically we might say, because we don't understand very much about heaven, do we? But the place where God lives outside of this universe um, came from there, came to be a man in, in the universe that he had created. Yeah, you know, there are scientists who say that um, we got here by accident. We're just the, the, the product of uh, billions and billions of random sequences of mutations and selection of the best and discarding of the worst of those mutations until finally we find ourselves to be like we are today. I'm afraid I haven't involved, evolved very much better than I was when I was born, perhaps. Uh, perhaps it's quicker a process in some of your cases. But now the scientists are beginning to say, well, it couldn't have happened just like that because the Earth's only been round, as they say, for three and a half billion years. And now they're telling us that three and a half billion years of random mutations and natural selection is not enough to get us from an origination of life three and a half billion years ago to the complexity of the environment and ourselves within it that we see today. Just not enough time. And so some scientists who are who have the great respect of the scientific community, uh, have begun to say, well, there must be something outside of this universe, a place where life originated and was brought to the Earth, already uh, started, so that it might continue its development here. And that's an interesting concept, isn't it? That, that a scientific mind could say, there's something, a power, outside of the power that we see in the universe itself, outside the natural things that we see around us. And we kind of invent it because we can't actually see it or describe it. But it's a must in the scientific viewpoint 
it's a prerequisite. Life can't have started here, so it must have started somewhere else. And we attribute it to a force outside of ourselves. And yet the Christian God is exactly that. And the explanation that we're given in our Bibles, these books that we have available to us, uh, are a communication from that God who originated everything, the God who's outside of time and space, who brought about these things that we see around us, caused them to be in the very first place, and caused them to have that DNA within them that would bind us to a future that was known to the Creator, physically. And so we are what we are, uh, by the handiwork of a Creator who's outside time and space. Is that so impossible for the scientific mind to accept? I don't think so. And I know that there's plenty of scientists on record for saying they believe that too. That the God of the Bible is the explanation for what we see around us. And it's as though God wanted to come here and be with us face to face. Face to face with his own creation. And so Jesus comes, God in human flesh, to live the experience of a human being here, right from end to end from birth as a baby, right the way through, to death as an adult, and to present during that lifetime's experience more and more information for those around him, and for those who came into face-to-face -face contact with him, to learn more and more about what God is like. So if God had come in the form of this human being, Jesus Christ, to reveal God to humanity, that was the job that Jesus did when he was here on earth. He did some important things besides that, and we want to get into that in a minute or two. But I just want to explain it in terms of God being face to face with us in the form of Jesus Christ, to tell us about what God is really like, so that when we think about our, our relationship with God, and we think about staring into the face of God, so to speak, and when we think about it, we think, well, do we see a frown, or do we see a smile? Do we have a Mary experience, or is ours somewhat different? So I want to think about those things with you. And when Jesus was here, a lot of what he did was recorded, and God has seen fit to ensure a written communication that would outlast the lives of those people who were first-hand witnesses, and be passed on and passed on and passed on, so we've got a Bible in our hands today. In fact, I've got a Bible in my pocket, and I want to read to you from it now. And if you don't have a Bible of your own, but you do have a cell phone, you can get the same thing that I'm looking at right now, the Bible, on your phone. I've got different versions of the Bible and different languages of the Bible on my phone, and they all come free, most of them. And this one is called The Message. The version is called The Message. It uses paraphrase to try and update the language that the original written parts of the Bible were in, and, uh, and make it meaningful to you and to me. And so I'm going to read to you. Uh, I'm going to read to you from this, this, this record that was made by a man called Luke. And Luke wrote this book, and it's been divided into 24 chapters, and we're going to read from the 18th chapter, when he's telling us about what Jesus taught. Jesus, God in human form, teaching us about what God is like. And who better to do it than God himself, in the form of Jesus Christ? And so we're going to read about a story that Jesus told. Luke chapter 18, here's what it says. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said, there was once a judge in some city who never gave a thought and cared nothing for people. A widow in that city kept after him. My rights are being violated, protect me. He never gave her the time of day, but after this went on and on, he said to himself, I care nothing what God thinks, even less what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. Then the master said, Do you hear what the judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? And then he continued to give another illustration. This is how it continues. 
He told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down on their noses at the common people. He said, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a taxman. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this taxman. I fast twice a week and tithe on all my income. Meanwhile, the taxman slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not daring to look up, said, God, give mercy, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus commented, this taxman, not the other, went home made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you'll become more than yourself. I want to just leave it there. But you can see how Jesus was using an illustration from everyday experience so that people would understand better what the character of God is, what he's like, what he smiles at, what he frowns at. He was encouraging people to pray to God that it's a real experience, it's worthwhile doing, and you should do it consistently, he says. And he gives us his illustration, this widow woman who had suffered injustice, but the judge wasn't about to give her justice, but she kept on, kept on, kept on. And it's as almost as though he thought that he was, she was going to come in running in one day with a frying pan and whop him over the head with it. He says, I'm going to be beaten black, to black and blue by this woman if I don't do something for her, so I'll have to do something. And then Jesus says, if an unjust judge will respond in that way to consistent pleading, what do you think God is like? Is he not going to listen to you when, he, when you call to him? And he wanted to give people confidence that God would hear them when they plead with him for justice. He's not going to waste his time. His time is going to be perfect. What do you say? His timing's not been very perfect in my life, in my experience. I've seen lots of unfairness. It's terrible, the things I've seen go on, and it all goes unpunished. Yet if I ever do anything wrong, the whole world comes down on top of me. It's just totally unfair. And when I'm being good, I never get rewarded for it. How, how can you give this illustration and say that's what God is like? Well, you're not the first, not the first person to think that way. If you go, go back into what's called the Old Testament of our Bible, into about what's in the middle of our Bibles, if it was a book that we were opening, the book of Psalms, and turn to the 73rd Psalm, 73, Psalm 73. Read what that guy says, and it's exactly the same picture. He's seeing everybody else succeed, and he doesn't seem to be getting anywhere, and all the ones that are dishonest seem to succeed, and, and his honesty doesn't seem to be rewarded. And then he goes to pray to God. And in the quietness of the experience of true and sincere prayer, it all becomes clear to him. And God puts it into his head to think about, what's the end game? Where does this picture end? For all of their success in this life, where do those people end up? They end up in a grave. Oh, thanks the righteous man, I'm going to end up in a grave. But you know, that's not the end. You're going to receive me to glory, he says in Psalm 73. I considered their latter end, and then I considered my own, and I realized that you're going to look after me sufficiently now, but you're going to receive me to glory, and they're going to wait, go away to everlasting shame and dishonor. So God presents himself as a righteous judge, and he doesn't have to accomplish all of that righteous judgment right now. He can hold it in abeyance, because he's got all eternity to make sure that fairness is achieved. It won't be achieved in this life. Life is too complex for everything to work out right for everyone. If that was a possible plan, you can be sure that God would have used it. And the way that he actually works is slightly different to that. He holds some things in reserve, and he's going to reward the righteous, and he's going to punish the wicked. Well, which category do you and I fall into? So he carries, Jesus has to carry on and tell another story. And he talks about a man called a Pharisee, a religious kind of guy. And he goes and he, he's going to pray to God, but he doesn't pray to God, he prays to himself. And he tells himself how good he is. And then there's another person that's there at the same time, a tax man. And he knows that he's not a good man. 
He knows that he's done wrong things. Perhaps he's guilty of extortion. Most tax men were in those days, and perhaps it hasn't changed that much. The man knew his guilt before God, and he doesn't even look up to heaven. He doesn't look up for the face of God. Perhaps he's expecting a frown if he were to face, be face to face with God. And so he just hangs his head and pleads with God for mercy. Mercy, that he doesn't get what he deserves in terms of judgment, but he's regarded as innocent by the mercy of God, and he's forgiven for what he's done wrong. And then he'll see God with a smile on his face. He'll have a smile and God will be smiling at him because he's been forgiven and cleaned up. And so Jesus says that man who had the right attitude towards God goes down, made right with God, and the other man doesn't. He's just as bad afterwards as he was before. Which is more like you and me in those characters? Do we deny there is a God? Do we give token acceptance to it and pray to him sometimes, but pray mainly for the things that we want? rather than the thing that we really need. What do we think it's going to be like for us when we meet God face to face? Face to face. It's a prospect that we should all be prepared for. It's guaranteed. We're all going to appear before God. And who will be our judge? It'll be the man that wants to smile at you, not frown at you. It'll be the man who, at the end of that earthly life, having been born as a baby in Bethlehem, found himself unjustly condemned to death, but willingly went to that death, and died on a cross outside Jerusalem these 2,000 years or more ago. And while he was there, the Bible tells us, God's communication with us, his creatures, the Bible tells us that God made to meet upon him the wrongdoing of us all, everything. Jesus became the substitute for the whole of mankind, past, present and future, for everything that we had failed in and everything that we did wrong in. And all the punishment that was due for that from a just God, a God who's not going to waste his time and is going to perfectly be perfectly just all of that was born by Jesus. And now, of course, Jesus has paid for us. We belong to him because he's paid for us. And he is enabled by the price that he has paid to offer us freedom. Freedom from the punishment that a just God should inflict upon us forever and forever and forever. Freedom to enjoy the bliss of heaven forever and forever and forever. Now, if you were facing bankruptcy and somebody just came along and not only paid off all your debts, but gave you an abundant fortune besides, how thankful you'd be, how happy you'd be. I just want to suggest to you, as we face a new year, that instead of looking upon it so negatively, as so many people around us thinking about another period of time hemmed in by restrictions on, our, on what we can do, Instead, find in your heart the joy of being able to look into the face of one who's bought and paid for you because he loved you and be ready to live for him for as many days as he gives you. In perfect justice, he's dealt with all of the problems of the past and he's secured for you a bliss for the future if you'll only accept his gift. Will you go into the next year with that kind of enthusiastic face-to-face uh, -face experience with Jesus Christ that's going to make the difference to the rest of your life. May it be so. God be with you. Thank you for listening.